Um, okay, we're going to get started on Look, panel there's, two. There's no job for me. Uh, I'm Joel Alicea, the president of the Harvard Federal Society. This right panel free, will focus it. on the effects uh, of a lack of intellectual so diversity, I'm assuming there is the a lack of intellectual diversity okay. within law school faculties. This panel will be moderated by Stuart Taylor, and I'll just read you his biography briefly. Stuart Taylor is a contributing editor for the National Journal and a non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institution. He received his undergraduate degree from Princeton University and his JD from Harvard Law School. Mr. Taylor has served as a legal journalist for several periodicals, including The American Lawyer and The New York Times. He is the author of the book Mismatch, which discusses affirmative action in higher education. So take it away, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me? Um, uh, Lest somebody get to it before I do, before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to make a comment on the diversity quotient of our panel. Four teachers of constitutional law, four of them white, three of them men. I checked with Justice O'Connor. She said that was one too many. Three of the white males went to Yale Law School. I checked with Justice Thomas, and he said that was three too many. <laughs> and uh, thank God we have Professor Norse here, who's diverse in some ways. Um, now, I'll first. In all, in all good ways, I meant to say. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with uh, Professor Richard Fallon, Ralph Tyler, Professor of Constitutional Law at this law school, as you all know. Uh, he's graduated of Yale University as well as Yale Law School, a Rhodes Scholar, a law clerk to J. Skelly Wright and Justice Lewis Powell. He's written extensively about constitutional law and federal courts law member of the American Law Institute, two-time winner of Harvard Law School's Sachs Freund Award, 2001 and 2006, uh, voted annually by the school's graduating class to honor excellence in teaching. Uh, Michael Paulson, University of St. Thomas Law School will go next. He's a distinguished university chair and professor, JD from Yale Law School, MA from Yale Divinity School, BA from Northwestern University, um, he was an editor of the Yale Law Journal, recipient of the Harlan Fisk Stone Prize for Appellate Advocacy, joined the Department of Justice in the Criminal Division Honors Program, and served as staff counsel for the Center for Law and Religious Freedom in Washington, D.C., and as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department. Professor Victoria Norse, professor of law at Georgetown, B.A. Stanford, J.D. University of California, Berkeley, uh, she has held chairs at Emory University and the University of Wisconsin, been a visiting professor at Yale, of course. I should have noted that at the outset. And NYU and the University of Maryland Law Schools. Her most recent book, In Reckless Hands, sounds like something I want to read. It tells the real-life drama of the 1942 Supreme Court case striking down state eugenics laws, a case announcing the right to marry and procreate. Professor Norse has published widely on constitutional history, the separation of powers, legislation and the criminal law. She clerked for Judge Edward Weinfeld, practiced at Paul Weiss, Rivkin, Wharton, and Garrison, served on the Senate Iran-Contra Committee, uh, she served under now Vice President Biden on the Senate Judiciary Committee, worked on the Violence, of Women's Act, which, Violence Against Women Act, which is back for an encore uh, in Congress. Did it, have they passed yes, it now? They passed it. Uh, and last, uh, Professor Nicholas Quinn Rosenkrantz, Professor of Law at Georgetown, teaches constitutional law and federal jurisdiction. He's written for the Harvard Law Review and the Stanford Law Review, among others. The first installment of his major work, The Subjects of the Constitution, was published in the Stanford Law Review in May 2010 and is already the single most downloaded article about constitutional interpretation, judicial review, and or federal courts in the history of SSRN. Uh, he clerked for Judge Frank Easterbrook, Justice Anthony Kennedy, and he too served at the Office of Legal Counsel. He's a senior fellow at the Cato Institute and serves as co-chairman of the Board of Visitors of the Federalist Society and a faculty advisor to the Georgetown chapter. And in the same order, uh, please begin uh, 10 minutes each, I hope, Professor Fallon. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting uh, this event. I think the topic is a fascinating one, and I must say it's not one that I had ever given any considerable amount of thought to whatsoever before the invitation 
to appear here, and so my views about many things are very tentative, uh, but what I am going to do uh, as best I can today is to stay in the middle space assigned uh, to this panel. That is, I am going to assume that there is considerable underrepresentation of conservatives and libertarians on major law school uh, faculties. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I think the effects of that are likely to be, and I am going to leave to the third panel uh, consideration about what ought to be done in light of the disparity and the effects that I think are likely to result. So to organize my thoughts, um, I want to work with two two-part categorizations. Uh, the first categorization uh, involves excellence in law, uh, teaching uh, the goals for which elite faculties ought to be hiring uh, law professors uh, so that we can think about whether there's going to be any falling short of those goals as a result of a lack of proportionate representation of conservatives and libertarians on major faculties. So I would say I think uh, hopefully entirely uncontroversially, I think the two uh, principal uh, indicia of excellence in law professors are their scholarship and their teaching. With respect to scholarship, are they discovering significant truths about law and related subjects, uh, or are they generating useful, critical insights valuable to ongoing discussions about law and related subjects. Uh, and then with respect to teaching, uh, I would think excellence has two uh, components. One component involves empowering students to succeed in law practice. Uh, and then the second related uh, component uh, is mentoring and inspiring students to be the best versions of their selves uh, that they're capable of being. And for this purpose, treating it as being part uh, of what the best version of themselves might be that they come uh, with a basic ideological bent, and if you've got liberal students, the best version of uh, their selves may be uh, somebody who is a more thoughtfully equipped liberal. If it's somebody who's a conservative or a libertarian, uh, the best version of that person's self may be somebody who is uh, more thoughtfully empowered as a conservative or a libertarian. The second uh, two-part categorization uh, scheme that I want uh, to use is one that I understand is very crude, but I think is none uh, the less uh, useful, uh, and that would be a scheme that sorts scholarship and teaching roughly into two uh, categories. Uh, one category consisting of scholarship and teaching uh, to which a law professor's overall political ideology is likely to be largely irrelevant, uh, and the other, uh, those fields and methodologies with respect to which a law professor's overall ideological um, outlook is likely to be visible on the surface and centrally uh, relevant. Uh, and so just a, a clarificatory word about the first of those uh, categories. Um, I th my own experience as a student was uh, taking the basic uh, private law courses. I seldom, if ever, knew uh, what my teacher's overall political ideologies were. Uh, here at Harvard Law School, in many years serving on appointments committees, reading uh, scholarship by candidates who are teaching contracts, torts, um, securities regulation, corporations. Um, I would n typically not have a clue uh, what the candidate's overall ideology is. I know in the business-related fields, uh, many of the people are working uh, with what might be libertarian or relatively seemingly libertarian free market assumptions, so students will often say to me uh, that we have a very conservative business faculty uh, here. Uh, I, against that, totally credit the findings of John McGinnis and co-authors uh, that these people may be sounding like free market libertarians in their corporations class and then uh, outside of that class be um, pro-abortion, pro-gay uh, rights, may want to redistribute wealth 
wealth radically through uh, the tax uh, system and thus sort into the category of Democrats, but I'm going to assume that there are a lot of categories of scholarship and teaching uh, for which that overall political ideology probably just isn't relevant. Uh, and then the second category uh, would be fields in which uh, people's overall political ideologies are likely to be visible on the surface and to have a deep influence on the way uh, that they teach and write about their subjects. Uh, this would certainly be true with respect to a number of subjects involving uh, regulation. It would be true with respect to constitutional law. It would be true with respect to family law. Now, some of you may say this is too crude uh, in a contracts class. Uh, there may be the occasional remark that betrays uh, the professor's overall political uh, outlook. I don't want to deny that. I'm not trying to say uh, anything so strong uh, is to say that that never happens, but it just isn't a central consideration of relevance, I think, and I know in my years on the Harvard Law School faculty, I've never heard anybody talk about somebody's overall political ideology when we were hiring a contracts professor or a corporations professor or whatever. Uh, so now, uh, with this two part categorical scheme, what are the effects of underrepresentation of conservatives and libertarians? If we start with respect to that category of cases uh, in which I think a law professor's overall political ideology is likely to be largely irrelevant uh, to his or her writing and uh, his or her teaching, uh, then it may be surprising, it may be disturbing in various ways that the disparity uh, exists, but if you want to look at measurable effects in terms of the overall quality of the scholarship and the teaching, uh, then the only way that I could imagine that happening would be if the, the very best people uh, weren't being hired uh, to teach uh, here, but even if the very best people weren't being hired to teach here or in other uh, top law schools, the adverse effects would not be measurable in terms of having a more diverse faculty, if by more diverse faculty we just mean overall political ideology. Uh, basically, I'm going to assume it doesn't much matter whether the person teaching the corporations course uh, and writing about corporations uh, is a liberal or a conservative, a Republican, uh, or a Democrat. Okay. Then we come to the second category uh, of fields and subject uh, methodologies where a candidate's appointment to candidate's overall political ideology is likely to be relevant. Uh, and I want to talk first about relevance to scholarship and then second and separately uh, relevance to teaching. The category of relevance to scholarship uh, is one that I find interesting, complex, puzzling, as I've been doing my best uh, to struggle with this subject over the past uh, week or so. It is the obligation of every incumbent faculty member on, uh, in a law school and considering an appointments uh, candidate to judge the quality of the scholarship. It is sometimes impossible to judge the quality of scholarship without judging the premises on which the scholarship rests. Uh, it is my view that in judging scholarship, uh, anybody ought to try as hard as he or she can uh, to look sympathetically generally from the inside uh, at the premises from which the work uh, departs uh, to try to see how that work fits into an overall intellectual uh, conversation. But at the end of the day, I couldn't say that I don't think conservatives and libertarians face headwinds uh, dealing with faculties today that are largely uh, liberal rather than conservative or libertarian, uh, nor could I say that I think it is necessarily bad that those headwinds exist. And this is just something that makes me uncomfortable. I'm struggling with it. If what anybody has to do conscientiously is to read the scholarship and try to figure out, is this well-reasoned work 
that begins with and proceeds sensibly from sound premises than somebody who begins with a skepticism of the premises is inevitably going to begin with some skepticism of the work. Now having said that, I voted for any number of uh, conservatives and libertarians uh, to come and join uh, the faculty uh, here. Some of them I'm pleased and proud to say uh, now are colleagues. Uh, a few of them have failed in the appointments process. Some of them have turned us down. Um, I don't think that it is impossible, certainly it isn't impossible for people uh, doing first-rate scholarship from a conservative and libertarian perspective to have uh, that scholarship accepted as excellent. But I would acknowledge that there are headwinds and what's uncomfortable is at the margins, I don't think we can talk about whether we have too few, too many or not enough or just the right number of conservative liber or conservatives or libertarians without getting down to cases and maybe even at the margins uh, having a debate about conservative and libertarian premises. There's no place outside of ideology, ideological debate from which to judge ideological debate. So I, this makes me uncomfortable, but I think that's just what the truth of the matter uh, is. Uh, so then finally, I'll come to the category of teaching uh, in fields in which uh, a professor's ideology may be pertinent to the way he or she presents the material, his or her uh, relative sympathetic, sympathy uh, to uh, methodological positions such as textual, textualism or uh, originalism. Uh, and here, I would say it seems to me highly plausible to think that there would be uh, beneficial effects to having more representatives of conservative, libertarian, uh, originalist uh, viewpoints. Uh, these are certainly viewpoints that are widely held by many judges and lawyers in our diverse legal culture for which we're trying to train uh, our students. If you make what seems to me the plausible assumption, an overgeneralization to be sure, but nonetheless the plausible assumption that people who are textualists and uh, originalists and libertarians will present those positions uh, more creatively and sympathetically uh, than people who aren't, then there may be some benefit to uh, our students. Uh, similarly, if part of the responsibility of law school uh, faculty is to serve as mentors and role uh, models uh, to students to help them become the best versions of themselves of which they're capable of becoming, uh, then it would seem to me entirely plausible to think uh, that we might get uh, better mentoring of conservative students, libertarian uh, students, to the extent that it is different difficult to get into uh, law teaching without having uh, mentors to show uh, you the path. We might even open up a way uh, through that mechanism through which in a future generation we would have more first-rate conservative and libertarian students well situated to go into the law school teaching uh, market. So I credit all of those things is potential benefits of having more conservatives and libertarians on public law faculties of major uh, universities. There would be difficulties about trying to operationalize a system of preferences based on ideology. To say that there would be difficulties is not uh, to say something of that nature uh, ought not uh, to be done, but happily that is a problem as I see it today for the third panel rather than for me to have to grapple with right now. Thanks very much, Professor Paulson. Uh, well, thank you, Stuart. And I'm really happy to be here. Uh, my thanks to the Federalist Society for organizing this, the Harvard Law School Federalist Society, to Joel, uh, who I think I met for the first time today, but I don't know if he remembers this. I helped you in commenting on your student undergraduate paper long ago, and so now he repays me by inviting me to the distinguished Harvard Law School. I must apologize for being a Yale Law School graduate, you know, and I, I really do have tremendous respect for Harvard Law School. I think it's a wonderful place for those people who can't get into Yale. <laughs> okay, now that I've thoroughly offended uh, my audience. Um, 
The, the topic for this panel is should law schools care about intellectual diversity? And I've got a little handout floating around, uh, which I'm trying to play against type just a little bit. It's called The Case Against Intellectual Diversity. And my premise was this, is like, wouldn't it be a little bit ironic if at an academic conference about intellectual diversity, everybody pretty much thought and said the same things? <laughs> and I actually think there is a prevailing orthodoxy in general about the idea of intellectual diversity. It runs along the following lines. It's very familiar, and to a large extent, it is actually true. And that is that in academia in general, and in law schools in particular, where you're devoted to an adversarial method that flows out of Anglo-American legal tradition, intellectual diversity is a value of singular importance. It's important to have diversity of views, div diversity of values, diversity of approaches, diversity of opinions that are expressed. And without it, there does tend to be a stifling uniformity. Ideas are not tested in the crucible of opposition. Uh, faculties, papers, presentations, teaching tends to become intellectually flaccid and complacent. Uh, I think ideas really are sharpened by gen uh, a genuine vigorous debate. Um, lack of intellectual diversity harms students in many ways. Uh, uh, minority viewpoints are diffusely suppressed, uh, almost casually, by, by, by being ignored, by not being recognized. Uh, and, and students having those viewpoints tend to become discouraged or repressed, develop severe psychological problems even. Um, and then, of course, I think it's a, a, a matter of, of uh, sort of obvious fact uh, that the debate is intellectually skewed and the faculty compositions of law schools are intellectually skewed in a decisively left-wing manner, you know, overwhelmingly so. And then the final point of this genu uh, uh, general consensus is that there's rampant hypocrisy about intellectual diversity in that everyone, I think, champions in theory the idea that there should be intellectual diversity, yet the reality on the ground is that most law faculties, most of the time, most places on most issues, sometimes without even thinking about it, resist serious competition of ideas. They seek to clone themselves, and they only want people who tend to think generally along the same lines, and they define the range of acceptable views in a way that really excludes the most serious intellectually competing alternatives. Okay. That's the general consensus, and I actually think there's much truth to it, much truth to it, okay? So much so that I almost hesitate to make the case against intellectual diversity. But, you know, I'm trying to be intellectually diverse here myself, and uh, uh, so for the sake of argument, I'd like to uh, advance mild dissenting views, or at least challenge in some respects uh, this, this orthodoxy, in that I think that the value of intellectual diversity in academic institutions might be a somewhat overrated commodity. It is overvalued in theory at the same time that it is clearly undervalued in practice. So I have like three propositions here that I've sketched out, uh, and I'll say a little bit about each one. Intellectual diversity is a subordinate instrumental value, and that the primary value of the argument for intellectual diversity is, a, is as a sword that conservative Federalist Society types can wield against entrenched evil uh, liberal orthodoxy. And then finally, that not all academic institutions should embrace intellectual diversity, and that we actually should seek a diversity of intellectual diversities uh, within institutions. So let me just say just a few words about each. I'm going to try to honor this 10-minute thing. Yeah, good luck with that. Um, <clears throat> my first proposition, and I raise it in the, in, in, in the spirit of a suggestion or provocation, is that intellectual diversity is a subordinate an instrumental value, it is not of value for its own sake. That it's an instrumental value in the search for what we might grandly call the search for truth. But the object of the intellectual inquiry is truth, with a capital T, not diversity of views for the sake of diversity. Okay? Sometimes intellectual diversity furthers the quest for truth, and sometimes it doesn't. And where it does, I think that's a value that should be championed, and where it doesn't, it has no particular value. In principle, I don't think one should ever value intellectual diversity for its own sake, 
over and against what one believes to be intellectual truth. If you think it's true, you really shouldn't deliberately tolerate known error for the sake just of having diverse views expressed. It's like a simple commonplace observation is that, you know, we wouldn't feel the need to have uh, a round earth view of science balanced in its presentation with a flat earth view. If you know the truth, there's really not that strong an argument for tolerating diversity. Now, the problem with this, of course, is that it tends to explain why the left, and the right would do it if it could, tends to suppress the viewpoints it finds intolerable because the left knows the truth and does not wish to tolerate significant degrees of error. The fundamental problem, though, is not that the left is seeking to advance the views it thinks are right. I think you should always advance the views you think are right. Um, but that the views that it thinks are right are, in fact, wrong, um, <clears throat> at least much of the time. And they seek to suppress the competition of ideas that I actually think are right. So my basic point is that intellectual diversity is not the goal. Okay? It's not the thing in and of itself. The goal is to better pursue truth through the vehicle of, of uh, intellectual diversity and to use that sort of trope of intellectual diversity to challenge and attack error. And that brings me to my second proposition, that the primary value of the argument for intellectual diversity is as a rhetorical weapon to wield against entrenched error. That is, that intellectual diversity is not so much important as a matter of principle, but as a means of providing a beachhead against the dominance of untruth, error, extremism, and nonsense in general that so pervades many of the discussions in America's law schools today. Or if I may switch metaphors, at least a little bit. Um, intellectual diversity is the bayonet with which we stab at error and falsity and we do it against the liberal academy at its point of greatest vulnerability. The chink in the liberal armor is the value that even liberal academics tend to attach to the idea of diversity. Ask just about any liberal academic whether they believe in intellectual diversity, and they'll say, well, of course, yes. You know, it's sort of an article of faith of the liberal creed, diversity of views, respect, toleration, et cetera. What that does is it makes it hard, at least in principle, for liberals to oppose uh, the development and expression of conservative, religious, libertarian viewpoints without collapsing into self-contradiction, massive cognitive dissonance, and even intellectual implosion. Um, but they do it anyway, right? Because I think the suspicion is that even though the left dominated law school faculties uh, say they believe in intellectual diversity, that when it really comes on the ground, uh, they don't. Rather, what they view, believe is not that all ideas have equal merit, uh, but that some have merit and some don't, and the ideas that don't have merit should not be entitled to a seat at the table of debate. And I think that's just the reality. Now, at some level, I think everyone actually agrees with that proposition. Conservatives and liberals both agree that there are, ide there are ideas that don't have merit and that don't deserve a seat at the table of uh, respectable debate. Uh, does Harvard Law School really need to have on its faculty a representative of an advocate for the view that race slavery was and still would be a good and proper thing for society and should be protected by our constitutional order. I don't think they, anybody really champions that sort of intellectual diversity. We all think there are some ideas that are wrong. Does Yale really need a Nazi for the sake of intellectual diversity? Now, the problem with liberal academia, of course, is that it tends to think many other things are in that same type of category. To identify opposition to same-sex marriage or support for coercive interrogation techniques as to enemy war criminal eras, uh, terrorists in order to obtain information or to believe that the uh, living, conceived, fetal human life is a person or is, should be entitled to the respect of treatment of persons. These are views that in many areas, especially public law of le le liberal legal academia, are regarded as anathema, that they are essentially, in the eyes of very many, 
analogous to holding a belief uh, in support of slavery or a support of Nazism. Now, that's a regrettable position, but in some ways, I want to argue that it's an understandable one. We all draw those lines. We just draw them in different places. We tolerate a range of views, and we value intellectual diversity within that range of views. But outside the range, forget about it. Uh, the real objection, then, that conservatives, libertarians, and persons of faith should have with entrenched liberal academia is not that liberals exclude some views. Uh, we all do that, or what if we could? The objection is that they exclude the wrong views or exclude too many legitimate views. That is, that liberal academia draws its lines of what are the boundaries of tolerance versus intolerance in the wrong places. Where we should be waging the fight is the fight and the, the ideas that should be included in the debate in the first place. My last point, am I way over? You're a little over. I'll go into the two minute drill. Okay. My third proposition, I'll just sketch it out and if people are interested we could explore it a little bit more in questions and answers. That, that not all academic institutions should embrace the idea of intellectual diversity for their institutions. And I sort of have two corollaries of this, or two lines of argument that support it. First, there should be intellectual diversity among academic institutions and not merely within them. The intellectual diversity, to the extent it is valuable as an instrumental matter in the quest for intellectual truth, is perhaps most valuable in the form of intellectual diversity among excellent, high-quality academic institutions. That provides students with a range of choice of high-quality institutions that stand for different principles. It provides for competition of ideas between universities, between literally schools, um, at a level of the institution, which is probably a higher, more valuable area for the debate to be occurring at. And it provides islands of truth and sanity in oceans of error, okay? So I think institutional diversity is, is very important. And for institutions to function as islands of truth, they have to be committed to what they believe to be truth. And that might mean for some such institutions, they should resist the siren song of intellectual diversity as a guiding principle for how they structure their own intellectual communities. Second related point is that constitutionally, there is a difference in principle between private institutions and public institutions, okay, uh, on the question of intellectual diversity. Private institutions in First Amendment terms are expressive associations, okay? The model here, the case analogy, if you like that sort of thing, is the Hurley versus Glib case, right? Yale Law School is its own parade. It is a private institution. It can be as wacky as it wants and should not be forced to include views that are contrary to its essential mission. Similarly, my present institution, University of St. Thomas, a religious institution, should be able to aggressively further the commitment to the principles it thinks are true and not succumb to the idea of intellectual diversity in the sense of trying to become a clone of every other secular law school. Um, public institutions, though, I think are a different matter. You know, for 16 years, I taught at University of Minnesota Law School before moving down the street. I think of it as defecting from the, from the Yankees to the Mets in a situation. You know, I'm regarded as an ethical. But, but I've had a look at public universities and at private universities. A private university is its own expressive entity. A public university has no First Amendment rights as an institution to advance a particular ideology or point of view. The legal analogy there would be that public universities should be limited public forums, or pu limited public fora, if you are. Excuse me, I think right. I'm being a little derelict. You're five minutes over, could you? Okay. Oh. <clears throat> and well, then I've got a plan to get equal time after the fact. I've got a punchline then. Yeah. If the question presented by the panel is, should law schools care about intellectual diversity? I think the answer is, some should care more, and some should care less. Thank you. Each of the other. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to allocate a little rebuttal time to each panelist who doesn't go over uh, yeah. to try and equalize time. And so, um, Professor Norse, uh, you, you have two ways to use that time. All right. 
Well, I want to thank uh, the Federal Society and Harvard for having me here today. Uh, my uncle taught at the Harvard Business School. My father went to the Harvard Business School, and that is why uh, I had no money to go to law school. So I went to Berkeley, uh, made my way through law school, and my father, uh, when he died on his deathbed, said that was one of the proudest things that he knew about me, despite my other accomplishments. In any event, my talk today uh, is a play in three acts. In act one, I shall agree with the premise. I shall be diverse from Professor Paulson uh, in disagreeing with his premise. Uh, I will express some doubts about the notion of defining diversity in political terms uh, as liberal and conservative in our particular political situation today. And in Act Three, I shall switch the topic entirely as a good law professor, and I will talk about what I believe to be at least as equally a dire a problem in diversity in the academy, and that is the lack of experience of law school professors in that which they teach. So Act One, yes, stated at its most benign level, I agree that there should be differing intellectual positions in the academy. Justice Scalia once praised a judge for being the liberal's favorite conservative and the conservative's favorite liberal. I take the jurisprudentially conservative position that there is a difference between law and politics. What I do as a scholar and what I once did working for the now vice president. To me, this is not only uh, what Justice Scalia has said about judges, but it's an inspiration for scholars. Knowledge hurts. It can break friends and encourage enemies. And the great scholar takes risks she considers the unthinkable obvious, which by definition means she will not have adopted the certitudes of the day. Now, I, I believe since most of you, you've seen my biography, and I want to thank uh, Stuart for his uh, generous introduction, but I think I have to testify to that a little bit here today, um, because I hope I have lived this ideal in the sense that I fought conservative claims that battered women's shelters were, quote, R&R &R shelters for bored housewives. That's a quote by a conservative pundit in the 80s when I was advising on the Violence Against Women Act. I also wrote my first law review article, and you can check it on the separation of powers in the Federalist Papers. I'm as proud as my book on race and eugenics as I am of fighting Mark Tushnet about his view about the history of Lochner. You can ask Randy Barnett, my great colleague at Georgetown. I have a new theory of statutory interpretation. Unfortunately, it's in the Yale Law Journal. But uh, it, it neither embraces textualism, considered a conservative position, or purposivism. It is a positivist theory, which is grounded in what Judge Posner and I have been going back and forth about. He said it couldn't be done, grounded in a theory of what Congress actually does. Now, to say that diversity is wise has a limit. And it has a limit because of the differences between what law and politics are. This is an old jurisprudential conversation. It has become dogma, it seems to me, within the academy that law is just politics. Having worked in politics, I can tell you there are, no, there are two very, very different things. And what I fear, particularly in our current political atmosphere, which is rather virulent, at least from my position in Washington, is that we will come to a place where we are simply shouting insults at each other. What Diego Gambetta, who's a brilliant sociologist, calls a claro culture, where you simply say, my opinions, I have no doubts or nuances about them. My uh, the opinion is packaged in a way so as to silence the audience. So if diversity means, and this is the problem with the category of diversity, means the battle of dogmas, it will ratchet up a politics and the idea of law of politics in my way, sense that I find very, very difficult and problematic from a scholarly position. Now, I can tell you from my experience, and I, this may be personal, and I'll give you a little bit of an insight into why I might think this, so my experience may color it. I was a nominee to the Seventh Circuit in 2010, and I was blue-slipped, which means that a single senator stopped my nomination. Now, this is a perverse compliment. It typically means you cannot be filibustered because you do not have uh, a, a record that can be exceedingly exaggerated. Uh, and uh, despite 4,000 pages on the Senate Judiciary website, in my case, uh, in any event, um, uh, the Chief Justice, for example, in his first nomination was blue-slipped. Um, 
In any event, I will tell you from my own experience recently that if you want to be nominated, even if you aren't filibusterable, you can expect your children to be threatened. It's a very sad tale of what is going on in Washington at a certain high level, particularly with nominees. And it reduces the, I think, and it should reduce and, um, people's sense that they can serve their government. Now, I've served my government in many, many ways, and I'm very happy to do, have done what I had, have done. I no longer need to do that. I am a scholar. I was just as thrilled at publishing this theory of statutory interpretation as um, having the honor to be nominated. Um, and I'm sure there are plenty of people who can take my place, although no one has been nominated for this seat in maybe five or seven years. Um, what I am concerned about in terms of this political culture that we live in, that it be translated into the academy, because I take the jurisprudentially conservative position, which I think Professor Fallon and others on this panel may take, which is that there is a difference between law and politics. When I teach my students about statutory interpretation, I teach my arguments before the DC Circuit when I was working for the Bush-Reagan Justice Department as a career appellate advocate. I don't teach them about the Violence Against Women Act. I don't teach them about how, in fact, the compromises made in the basement. I mean, you can read a book about that in a book called The Equal that was um, published recently about the history of it. Um, I very much believe in this separation, and I am fearful that in our present political environment, any type of diversity built upon labels of political parties or political positions will in fact aggravate that kind of politics because it will bring professional holders of knowledge, the academics, into a situation where they will attract and select more people who are more virulent and more of the Claro type. So the point of diversity is not some namby-pamby pluralism, which is a nostrum much bandied about and, in my view, not terribly helpful. I am not pluralistic about Lochner or purposivism or uh, eugenics. I am not neutral about those things. It does seem to me that when you're talking about diversity and you do it in terms of political labels, you have to be careful about what precisely you're going to do, as Professor Fallon indicated, to try and create a metric for measuring that. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I'm on a faculty with the leading libertarian, Randy Barnett. I've got the leading progressive, Robin West. Yeah, that's my, you know, Georgetown, go Georgetown speech. Um, so. I'm thrilled with that, but I wouldn't call what they do and my conversations with them political in the slightest. So, Act Three. I'm not sure this is the most pressing problem in legal academia. I have another position, which will seem troglodytic to folks like Mark Tushnet, I suppose, and even most of people on my own faculty, I expect. And that is that the most pressing demand for diversity in the faculty is a diversity of experience within the law. We've turned into a PhD culture. We've turned into a Yale culture and a Harvard culture. And some of that is good and some of that is bad. In my own field, which is principally legislation, not constitutional law, um, I am not in a binder full of women, to use that phrase. I am in a very small folder full of scholars. I have not done the figures, but someone else has. 5% of all law faculty in the top 20 faculties have any experience in any legislature, state or federal. 5%. Now, I bet there's a little bit more in the executive branch. We had Jack Goldsmith. We've had people in OLC. But what about Harold Coe just came to my faculty and said he thinks people need more. He's dean of the Yale Law School. Need more, former dean. Need more people who have high-level executive experience since he's been um, the state department's legal advisor. I suspect this also occurs, and it, although to a lesser degree, in corporations and securities and tax. For all the students in the room, you might want to ask, how many deals have those professors who are teaching you about mergers really done? Now, many people have a few years at a firm just like I had, but do they really have substantial experience? Now, I don't think that is sufficient. I don't want the academy to become a trade school which is what the argument would be against this. Um, I think we need to marry that with a very high level of knowledge and a willingness to write. 
there is no question that I would not consider a candidate on an appointments committee, whether libertarian or conservative, without some experience in their field, but plus writing, because that's what we do. We think. That's what we're paid to do. It's an extraordinary opportunity and obligation. There is nothing anti-intellectual about my claim. It goes back to Peirce and Holmes, who argued that the life of the law is not logic, but experience. And if you want to go even further, you can go to Einstein, hardly a thinker, not in abstract terms, who said that the only source of knowledge is experience because it was only because his views were grounded in empirics that they were taken seriously. Experience is as much a focus of, and proper focus of diversity in my view, and one which can in fact provide a resistance to dogmatism as ideological diversity. And I'm afraid there is a prejudice against those folks who have had significant experience. Now, I think this is getting better, but when I went out there, several law schools said, oh, you have too much experience, so you're not going to write. Now, I'm going to try and prove this to you in my own field of legislation by asking you this. Who in the room knows 12b6, rule 12b6? Okay, what is it? Yeah, but all right, it's motion to dismiss. All right, rule 11. Oops. <laughs> well, that's about legal practice and filing a frivolous claim. Oops. All right, rule 22. Rule 22 happens to be the most important rule in our government. It is the cloture rule on filibuster. It's the rule that creates the necessity for 60 votes in the Senate, which means no bill can pass without gleaning an enormous consensus. It means a recipe for gridlock, which may be a good thing if you like limited government, which I believe the founders believed in. But I guarantee you, there are very few people, whenever I go and ask what that rule is, who know it. And if lawyers aren't going to understand that, who will? Thank you, Professor Rosencrantz. Thank you. So I'm delighted to be here, and I do want to thank uh, the Harvard chapter and Joel in particular for organizing this conference. I actually believe this is exactly the sort of thing that the Federal Society ought to be uh, doing and ought to do more of. So I think it's terrific that we're having this conversation. And I'll offer my two cents on the next panel, what we ought to be doing about this. I would say the single most important thing that you all can do is shine a light on this issue. So people don't actually know these facts. People don't know Jim Lindgren's facts about this. And I think when they do, it usually gives them pause. So I'd say the single best thing you can do is talk about this. Uh, so, but I'm gonna get back to the topic of our panel. I'm going to um, adopt the premise that there is indeed a lack of intellectual diversity in law schools. Uh, you know, I think the facts that you heard from Jim are kind of inexorable on this, so I don't think we need to uh, re-argue that point. Um, I'll just add my impressions from Georgetown Law School. Uh, Victoria is my colleague, and maybe she'll um, disagree with me, but we, um, we're a faculty of, I think, 119. And the number of, uh, and I think it's important not to get too wrapped up in these definitions, but the number of conservatives or libertarians or Republicans or folks to the right of the American center or really however you want to describe this category is three. Three out of 119. And, uh, you know, actually to Jim's point, the center of gravity of the other 116 is um, not just left of center, but actually t to the left edge of the Democratic Party. Now, but so there are three. And uh, the good news is that that number has tripled in the last decade. So that's <laughs> big progress for us. And we're very happy about that. The bad news, though, is that the consensus at Georgetown seems to be that that's plenty. Plenty and... Um, possibly even one or two too many, <laughs> I think. So that's a shame, I think, in any uh, department. Um, in, it's actually, it's true, by the way, throughout universities. This is not just a law school problem. I'll just give you one additional fact. In 2008, 
uh, the number of Yale professors who gave money to the John McCain campaign, were there were five. Now that may sound like a big number to you, but now I'm talking about the whole university, all of Yale, five people total. Um, in law school, in the, from Yale Law School it was one, and that person no longer teaches at Yale Law School. So the, um, the, uh, the numbers are pretty stark, and they're particularly stark, they're stark at Georgetown, but you know, actually I actually don't think the Georgetown numbers are terribly atypical, actually. So, uh, so I, I think this is an ironic kind of shame in uh, the university in general. I think it's kind of particularly ironic in law school. And the reason is, it's just a fundamental axiom of American law that the best way to get to truth is through the uh, clash of zealous advocates on both sides. So, you know, these are folks who have, in theory, dedicated their lives to the study of that system. Uh, and yet, at most of these schools, on most of the important issues of the day, one side is dramatically underrepresented or um, you know, really not represented at all, really not represented at all. Uh, at Georgetown, most students will graduate without ever laying eyes on a Republican behind a podium. They just will never see what that looks like. They will never see it in their three years. Okay, so I think this is bad in many ways. First, I think it's bad for the professors themselves. And to Jack uh, Goldsmith's point, I actually think it's worse for the liberal professors. I, mean, I think it's bad news for the liberal professors um, to be blunt about this. You know, a certain kind of intellectual laziness can set in if you find yourself in a room with people who agree with you all day, every day. Um, just by way of comparison, I'm a, also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute. Um, Cato has a mission statement. Cato is a libertarian think tank with an actual libertarian mission statement. There you would expect some intellectual homogeneity. I mean, you'd, and maybe you'd say there actually should be intellectual homogeneity there. And yet, you know, I have to say there are more vigorous debates in the hallways at the Cato Institute than there are at Georgetown Law School. At Georgetown, um, folks agree. Folks agree on the big issues of the day. Not to say you can't find things, can't find people quibbling about different things at different margins, but on the big issues of the day, lots of folks agree at Georgetown. So, you know, I think that's bad. And, um, you know, I think a certain kind of mushiness can set in in faculty workshops where people only quibble at the edges. Uh, so, you know, I just think it's bad intellectually and particularly bad uh, for the liberals. Um, now, it's bad for the faculty in maybe a more important way, fundamental way. I think it makes them bad analysts and bad predictors of law as it actually happens out in the world, which you might think was an important part of the job. Uh, so, you know, because elite American faculties are so far to the left of the American judiciary, of the judiciary we have here today, they become increasingly poor at predicting or analyzing the actual practice of American law. Now that's you know bad for them, I think. It's also kind of bad for the legal universe who you know would like to turn to the Harvard faculty for wisdom and insight about these things. Um, I'm gonna illustrate this point with three examples. So consider uh, Rumsfeld v. Forum for American and Individual Rights, Rumsfeld v. Fair. Um, countless law schools and law professors argued that the Solomon Amendment, which withheld certain federal funds from colleges and universities that restrict access, restricted access of military recruiters to students, violated the First Amendment. Okay, now I was new at Georgetown when the faculty decided to get involved in this case, and uh, so I was a little bit um, tentative about uh, making a, too big of a stink about this, but I did actually um, take aside one of the champions of this um, project at Georgetown and uh, say that I, you know, I thought we were making a mistake in filing this brief or in getting involved with this case. And she said um, she understood completely, uh, obviously, I must have very strong and religiously motivated objections to homosexuality, and she wanted me to know that she had nothing but respect for those views, um, however benighted they might uh, be. I said, uh, no, actually I 
don't, and in fact, I'm in favor of gays in the military as a matter of policy, then she was confused, and I explained to her what I have strong objections to, passionate objections to, are dumb legal arguments. What you all are arguing for makes no sense here. That's what I don't want to sign on to. I don't want to be a part of this brief. And that was unfathomable to her. She hadn't heard that before. And I think it was similarly unfathomable to her when the case comes down 8-0. Comes down 8-0, these great minds of Yale and Harvard and Stanford and Georgetown, and they get not a single vote. Not Stevens, not Souter, not Ginsburg, nobody. And, you know, they might say, well, you know, it was a matter of principle to make the argument. No, I think they actually thought they were going to win that case. That's what I was hearing. I was hearing them thinking they were going to win. My second example is going to be the Obamacare case. So when Randy Barnett first crafted the Commerce Clause argument against the individual mandate, um, the, I'd say the Georgetown faculty was not particularly receptive to it, didn't actually think it um, uh, you know, we could say rejected the argument, but I don't think rejected's the right word. I mean, it was really, it was closer to, uh, you know, ridiculed. I mean, it really was not taken seriously. Not taken seriously at Georgetown, not taken seriously um, in the academy generally, and declared, you know, in the popular parlance to be um, outside of the legal mainstream, is what we say. And again, kind of utter shock when the Supreme Court decides 5-4 that actually Randy's right. You can't actually mandate individuals to buy things under the Commerce Clause. People were, seem to be very surprised by that. Now I'll give you my third example. This one's a little bit more uh, personal, and so I was, I'm a little bit uh, diffident about discussing it. But so in 2005, I wrote an article arguing that Missouri v. Holland was wrongly decided, that actually um, a treaty cannot increase the legislative power of Congress. And I'm delighted to report that it was published in the Harvard Law Review in 2005. Uh, delighted further to report it was my second article published in the, 2000, uh, in the Harvard Law Review. So I was very pleased and proud to have it there. I'll maybe just tell you how it happened that I was able to get it into the Harvard Law Review. It had in it a bit of an insight. The insight was this, um, Lou Henkin, had made the argument that a treaty can increase the legislative power of Congress um, via a particular bit of constitutional drafting history. He'd looked at the history, and per the constitutional drafting history, it seemed to say that, um, that, uh, Congre that uh, the framers actually contemplated this question and actually had drafted the Constitution to give them this power, and, um, and they'd changed it, but they'd changed it because it was superfluous, Lou Hankins said. Um, I took a look at the historical documents, and it turned out to be just false. This actually just doesn't say that. This actually doesn't say that. Not, not debatable, just actually false. Um, so that was the, I think that's the kind of insight that the Harvard Law Review folks um, liked. But consider that had stood for decades. That had stood for decades. Um, was I some genius at doing historical research? Not at all. It was extremely easy to do. Just flipped open the volume. Why is it then that I was the first person to do it? I think it said, I think Lou Henkin said what most people wanted him to say because they are inclined to agree with him. They're not inclined to question his premises and thus they're not inclined actually to flip open the book. So I think you find a lot of, law, a lot of, kind of wrong arguments persisting for a long time because um, there's no one around to challenge them. There's no one around to challenge them. So, okay, so uh, I had this insight. The Harvard Law Review kids happily decided to publish it. It was my job talk paper when I was on the teaching market, and the consensus seemed to be that it was nice and impressive that it was in the Harvard Law Review, but, um, you know, it was just too far out of the mainstream, really, for, you know, many of these top 15 uh, schools. Now, um, the happy coda to this story is the Supreme Court's just granted cert on this exact issue. So they actually are now going to consider overruling Missouri v. Holland. Uh, but again, you know, this kind of, and, and I think the academy, again, is going to be kind of shocked to find that this position garners a bunch of votes at the Supreme Court. So, you know, this is really another argument for why you should care about intellectual diversity in law schools. I think law faculty are just getting worse and worse at evaluating what arguments are going to work in court here in the U.S., here today. Now, a possible answer maybe is 
uh, you think that the Supreme Court is crazy. And many professors do think this. So they say, you know, I don't especially want to be good at predicting what the court does because they're, they're just a bunch of right wing nuts. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be actually good at that. But I don't think that's a sufficient answer because um, even if you don't, even if you don't actually care, uh, most students do. Most students do. And most students would like to learn how to predict what courts do. They would like to learn how to craft arguments that are going to persuade uh, judges. So, and this really brings me to uh, my final point, which I think is the, the most important reason to care about intellectual diversity in law schools. You, know, you should care for, because uh, students should care. Um, it's bad for students. They're really getting only half of a legal education. Again, at Georgetown, 116 to 3, many of them will simply never lay eyes on a conservative or libertarian. Now, you may say that liberal professors are careful to present both sides of the argument. And, you know, I think Jack suggested that maybe professors should be more conscious of that or could do that in a better way or present them in a more sympathetic way. I, you know, I have to say, in my experience, the liberal version of the conservative argument is generally a pale shadow of the actual conservative argument. I don't think they're quite, you know, as presented by someone who actually believes it. So I don't think that's quite a substitute to say, well, don't worry, I'll give you the Justice Thomas view as well. Um, you know, to put the finest point on it, you all are coming here to Harvard Law School and you're spending a hundred thousand plus dollars on this education in which you are learning how to argue against fictional Republicans. And uh, when you graduate, you're gonna find you have to argue against real ones and they're different and they're actually more effective. They're actually more effective than the fictional ones. So, um, uh, so uh, you know, I wanna say that's the, really the kind of the crucial reason that why it matters. I wanna, um, by the way, parenthetically, I think I wanna disagree with Dick that it only matters in certain courses or certain areas. You know, I actually think it matters pretty much throughout the curriculum. You know, I can just say from my experience as a law student in, you know, contracts or torts or property or whatever, uh, you know, I agree. I think probably most students didn't think they were getting a particularly skewed view of it all. But I went and I looked at the Federalist Society bibliography for these different courses, contracts and torts and property. And then I went and did the outside reading. Then I came into class and actually presented the other argument, tried to argue with my professor. And I was just a 1L, I'm sure I wasn't that effective, but other than me, you wouldn't have heard that voice. I mean, you wouldn't have heard the arguments in the other, on the other side in contracts or torts or property. So I actually, I do think it matters in a wide range of courses, not just constitutional law. Um, now, so, uh, you know, I guess, suppose the best answer you've heard to this dilemma thus far is the Mark Tushnet answer that if you don't like it, you should just go to Pepperdine. But I don't actually, I don't think that's a satisfactory answer. I think you should um, actually uh, lobby for some change here at Harvard. I hope, <clears throat> I hope we'll have some time for audience questions. So I'm going to ask one, perhaps an occasionally compound question of each panelist in the order in which they spoke, starting with Professor Fallon, who having adhered to the 10 minutes, I think is entitled to be a little discursive in his answer to my first question. So I'm going to make it a two-part question just to, just to invite discursiveness. The first part is to respond to anything you heard after you spoke with which you disagree. And the second is a, perhaps a little bit idiosyncratic on my part. We've heard a lot about conservatives and liberals, conservative libertarians and liberals. I haven't heard the word moderate or political independent during this conversation or the previous one. And about 40% of us in the American public, which is more than Democrats or Republicans, I think, you know, characterize ourselves as roughly in that zone. I would also be so bold as to suggest that Jack Goldsmith, who in a law school environment is, of course, a conservative, his political views, I believe, quite clearly, knowing him quite well, are to the left of the majority of the American people on, most, on a lot of issues, maybe most issues. I don't think he'd quarrel with that. He might say, well, about the center, but certainly not far to the right. And in that context, Professor Tushnet's response, other than saying go to Pepperdine, how many law clerks from Pepperdine on the Supreme Court? Uh, his response that, that you get 
I think, uh, what is it, the default line, you can get liberals but not too liberal. You can get conservatives, but you can get very conservative conservatives. Another way of looking at that is, that is the faculties might say, well, we got a couple of those Ayn Rand nuts already. Who needs more? As in, who needs a conservative who, on the spectrum of the American people, would be a moderate? And so the question is, is there a place in this debate for moderates? Is everything really about liberals and conservatives? And if there is a problem of not having much conservative representation on law school faculties, could there also be said there's not much moderate representation either? OK, thank you um, very much. There's uh, a great, great deal on the table, and I won't uh, be able to respond to all of it. It's been fascinating for me to sit here uh, through the conversation. I've learned uh, a lot. As I said, I hadn't been thinking about these <coughs> topics uh, to the extent that uh, I perhaps should uh, have before the past week or so. Um, <coughs> l let me reflect a little bit on um, a couple of the things that Nick Rosencrantz um, said. I'm not sure disagree is exactly the right word, um, but I'm not ready wholly to sign on <clears throat> either. Um, so when the problem when it comes to faculty hiring um, is the problem that there is always an opportunity cost. It's a zero. Um, some game. Um, y th there would be some uh, advantages uh, if you could have a representative of every possible position on a faculty, but if you just decided what you wanted to do was have every possible position uh, represented, uh, then the point that Mike Paulson makes, some of them would be uh, absurd, uh, not things uh, that were intellectually tenable, not worth having around for that uh, reason. Uh, and then once one moves in from that, there is a value to diversity to be sure, but what one wants ultimately is the best intellectual quality. And I'm happy to accept the proposition that intellectual diversity in some situations may be a component of intellectual uh, quality. Uh, but what one always needs to be doing is to be making trade-offs. Now, when I introduce this, bus, this notion of the need to make trade-offs, I think I may be uh, disagreeing with Nick insofar as he thinks that the John Stuart Millian uh, idea that what we want to do is to provoke the widest possible uh, argument um, has any particularly useful carryover to the question of what faculty members a particular institution ought to be hiring. Uh, the issue isn't whether anybody should be shut up. Uh, whether there should be censorship so that people didn't uh, get to offer their views in the law reviews or uh, in public fora of different kinds. The question is, in every case, who is the best person to hire for this faculty right now? And the notion that it would be highly desirable to have as many diverse voices as possible going in the society answers a different question. Is it good to have as many possible voices going uh, in the society from the question, um, given scarce resources of particular uh, limited number of spots, uh, whom should this uh, law school hire right now? Um, so the, and again, I'm, I, you remember my position is, is a pro-diversity position, um, but it's not pro-diversity for that uh, for that reason. Uh, the second uh, thing uh, that Nick said that I wanted to speak to uh, was he said uh, he is resisting the idea that I offered that there are many fields and courses uh, to which people's overall political ide ideologies are not likely to have much relevance. Now, I tried to be careful to put it that way. I tried to uh, make it plain that I was uh, totally prepared to accept uh, the idea that there may be uh, 
in any possible discussion of any uh, subjects, uh, any subject, uh, whether it's uh, uh, contracts or medieval uh, history or securities regulation, where uh, somebody's overall political views uh, matter. I don't think that that's going to happen uh, much. And so then the example that I uh, gave was the example of uh, somebody who operates with free market assumptions uh, in analyzing corporations or securities uh, issues is I think is, is the typical position uh, among people who teach in those fields. Not everybody. I think that that's the typical uh, position. It's a position that is totally compatible, I think, uh, either with somebody's being a liberal Democrat and that, that is, you could be uh, in favor of operating uh, economic markets on uh, free market principles, but as I said, believe uh, in gay rights and believe in abortion and even believe gay rights and abortion should be protected uh, by the Constitution, and you could be in favor of uh, totally redistributive uh, taxation. So you've got a position about how to think about securities uh, issues that's entirely compatible uh, with either the person's being uh, somebody who would be classed as conservative or libertarian or the person's being uh, classed as liberal. And so at that point, um, Nick is talking about, well, there are three Republicans uh, on the Georgetown uh, faculty. You can walk around the halls at Georgetown and never see a Republican. Um, now, at this point, I find myself in, in, in sympathy uh, with something uh, that Professor Norse uh, said. That seems to me to be a dangerous road to start to walk down. Um, do, you, do, do you want to be counting uh, Republicans and Democrats? And do you want to know how many Republicans and Democrats there are on the Harvard faculty or the Georgetown faculty? And do you, as members of the Harvard Federalist Society, if you're here as members of the Federalist uh, Society, want to be coming to deans uh, or uh, faculty members and faculty uh, meetings and say, here, I've got the list. And what we need is not more people who represent this point of view that would be useful or that point of view uh, that would be useful. Uh, but what we want is more Republicans. Uh, now, if you thought that things were so bad in the sense, I mean, so, so, so suppose you thought this. Uh, suppose you thought uh, that most members of the Harvard faculty or the Georgetown faculty or whatever uh, faculty it would be actually do keep such a list. I mean, people don't register uh, their political uh, affiliation, but suppose you thought everybody's looking for clues. What we're trying to do is to run a club here, uh, and we're going to get as many Democrats as we can, and we're going to keep as many Republicans as we can out. If you thought things were that bad, then I guess you might very plausibly think that drastic circumstances require drastic remedies, uh, and that's exactly what you ought to do. You ought to get your list, and you ought to uh, demand um, some sort of uh, minimum quota uh, for Republicans. But I don't think things are that bad, uh, and I think with respect to many fields, uh, and in terms of the general tenor and the way it feels to be part uh, of an intellectual uh, community, uh, that would be absolutely disastrous. Now, remember, I said that as somebody who said uh, that I think uh, that in the public law uh, fields and fields involving uh, regulatory policy in particular, we do have uh, probably on this uh, law school faculty a uh, disappointing underrepresentation of particular points of view. And again, I don't care if these people are registered as Republican or Democrat, if they're registered Democrat because that's about abortion and that's uh, about um, gay rights when what we're talking about is regulatory um, policy. Um, so I, I, I do think we have some underrepresentation. I think that's probably less good for our teaching. I, I, I think we could teach uh, better, largely for the reasons Nick described. I think uh, we're probably pretty much uh, in accord uh, with uh, about those um, views. Um, but I think there may be 
an underlying disagreement about how bad uh, things are and about what we ought to be trying to make seem uh, relevant in the university because law schools are, of course, a part of the university. Um, so I think that uh, gets to nearly everything that I wanted to say about what other people uh, had said. And then the question was raised, well, what about moderates or political independence? And with respect to that question, I think that last part of what uh, I said um, is pretty much responsive, uh, just as I think would be a bad uh, idea if when we were doing hiring, if I thought, well, we ought to have uh, everybody you have to check a box, uh, Democrat, Republican, or independent, or liberal, conservative, or moderate. I think that that would be unfortunate. Um, I don't have the sense that people that I would think of as being moderates are disturbingly underrepresented in those uh, f areas of teaching and scholarship where people's political ideologies are pertinent. But having said that, I just would have to allude back to something uh, that I said uh, in my initial remarks, and that is any time you want to know do we have enough or too many or not enough, of people who are espousing a particular view, I think that that is just not the right way to look at it until you say, whom exactly do you have in mind? Uh, how good uh, a scholar, how good a teacher would that person be? How much would that uh, person uh, bring to scholarship and teaching? So now I used up all my extra Thank time you. and more. Thank you. Um, yeah, we have 12 minutes left, so I'll, I hope we can get three quick questions and then some from the floor. Professor Paulson. Uh, there was conversation uh, earlier and, and now about diversity across law schools versus diversity within law schools. You used the phrase islands of truth, I think, in reference to uh, conservative law schools. There's Pepperdine, which we've talked about. There's your school. I don't know if it's conservative. St. Thomas. Uh, I happen to know a little bit about George Mason University, which I think is, is it in the top 20 yet? Have they had any Supreme Court clerks yet? But I do happen to know that the American Bar Association was threatening to discredit them. Why? Because their racial preferences weren't large enough. So these little islands are kind of little islands, aren't they? Is there really any, I mean, if the question is, is a young conservative who wants to get a balanced uh, law school education from the standpoint of the ideologies of his professors and then go on to a Supreme Court clerkship or whatever, What's out there for him, or her, I should say? I think there are maybe two or three arguably conservative law schools, and at the upper echelons, they're not, uh, you know, the, the islands of, of resistance, you know, the bulwarks against tyranny, um, are beleaguered, small, scattered, and uh, do not have the same cachet as Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. Um, I mean, Princeton doesn't yet have a law school. Though I'd heard that Princeton, in annual surveys, always is rated as having one of the very best law schools, which was... Um, <clears throat> my short point on, on law schools is that th there is a need, there, there is a, uh, a virtue to having uh, diversity among institutions and that perhaps one of the things that could be advanced is the idea of high quality law schools that are co not committed to uh, 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 leftist agendas. Um, I, I don't know the facts specifically of the, the, the George Mason situation but it calls to point another uh, 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 problem is that when speaking of diversity at largely liberal law schools, they identify diversity with racial diversity. When I was at University of Minnesota, we adopted a diversity policy that decided to promote racial, ethnic, and other forms of intellectual diversity. Now, wait, think about that. To identify race, gender, or personal characteristics with the way you think is engaging in precisely the type of racial stereotyping that should be uh, disapproved. Intellectual diversity, diversity of viewpoints, is something apart from uh, uh, individual characteristics. And, and you know, I, I, I was amused by the story that that Nick told. 
about you know people making the assumption that because he held a certain view on a certain issue that that must reflect a particular uh, stereotype. <coughs> Let me just say 10 seconds about what Ten. Dick Fallon said. Um, I think sometimes there is conscious discrimination against some points of view that the legal academy regards as just so horrible that they cannot have that on their faculty. And I think a much greater problem is that there is such widespread agreement among many liberal elite faculties about what the right, right viewpoints are that they don't even recognize the fact that excluding a competing viewpoint is engaged in discrimination. Because who would think that someone could make a credible argument of a type X, Y, and Z? It's just not within the realm of contemplation. And so I think a large part of the problem of lack of academic or intellectual diversity is a consequence of people all thinking the same and not even recognizing that there is to some extent a problem. Thanks. Now, we've, uh, we're running uh, late and we want some time for audience uh, questions, so I'm going to ask our, our last two panelists to forgive me for not asking them the brilliant multi-part questions I've crafted. <laughs> Go to the floor and request that uh, and, and, op and ask that uh, ask that professors North and Ro Norse and Rosencrantz have first crack at answering questions, unless you have one that really has to be answered by someone else. Yes. And did I say 10 minutes over? We're going to go till 3:10. If, if that, my response in part was to, to, to Vicky Norris's comments about Georgetown, which you may have already responded to. Um, and what generally happens is that the people who are most interested in the matter that much, um, it's really a unintended strong argument against um, uh, against diversity because it's argued that it matters a lot for, for intellectual diversity that you have race and gender diversity. I've looked at views on it on law, views on general views in general public, views on education issues, and um, a politics is more important than gender, much more important than gender. It's about the same as race. So if if politics doesn't matter, then maybe race or gender doesn't matter either for some of these things. As far as Georgetown, I mean, Georgetown has a long history. I was shocked that you used Georgetown as an example. Um, I, I remember having them claim, we're looking for a conservative, we're always looking for a conservative. And uh, one of Georgetown's uh, and I said, Philip Hamburger is in George Washington in your town. He, in my view, better than anyone you have on your faculty. Um, you should hire him. But I know you won't because you're not really looking for a conservative. And then he went on to Chicago and Columbia um, uh, and, and they passed him up. When they made an offer to Gary Lawson, again, looking for the conservative slot there, he turned them down. And, and someone said to uh, one of our faculty members, they're shocked he turned it down. Uh, and Lawson was at the question then. And uh, the faculty member said, maybe he didn't want to be an animal in a cave with people uh, pointing to him and <laughs> saying, there's the conservative. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, the, the suggestion that, that you know, what you're just hiring, you're just trying to hire the best, of course, mistakes are made. But I just looked at the SSR and down at Georgetown. And the top two out of 119 are, in fact, uh, two people who are among the three. And you're pretty high up unless you're not, not in the top two. I looked at Northwestern. Four of the top five in SS Scott are in down at Northwestern are, are, um, are conservative, even though only a third of the faculty is conservative. Um, the, um, uh, I, I don't think Barnett is happy. Why hasn't Harvard hired Barnett? Um, he's clearly done more important work than all but a very small part of the faculty. He's a graduate of the school. He's got practice experience. He's a prosecutor. Um, you know, you, you look at these things. These are not hard to see who's out there to hire. And suggesting that you're not hiring the best. The other thing is that you've been able to predict. You know, we had a fellow come in who had an offer from George Mason, and he was considering a fellowship at, at, at Northwestern. And um, uh, Lisa Bernstein, who's sort of a savant on this stuff, said, well, you, know, you probably won't get that much advantage because given your libertarian orientation, really only Virginia or Northwestern is going to consider you among the top schools. So basically, you probably end up with George Mason anyway. So he comes to Northwestern, and it turns out the only two schools I consider are more Virginia and Northwestern. Uh, North, take another Georgetown example. There's a person who, I'm sorry, this, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a person who, who you guys, we made a tenure track offer to, you guys made a, a, a teaching offer to, who has more SSR RA downloads than anyone in your faculty. And we told them, look, if you're not on tenure track, you are not going to get a job permanently. And he said, no, no, they're saying they really want conservatives. I'll get, get off the tenure track and get off the, the that sort of thing. Never happened. And I say, if, 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 there weren't, if they're hiring the best, you wouldn't be able to predict these things happen if you had time to turn them up. Can I respond? Yeah. Um, I, 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 I,
respond? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not here to defend a particular political persuasion or identify a faculty as having a political persuasion because I take the jurisprudentially conservative position that law and politics are different. So I'm not going to count professors at Georgetown. I've only been there a short time, Jim. You know, you know, you all wanted me to go there. I know you all want me to go there. You didn't originally hire Randy Barnett. You know, I'm not going to get into that stuff. I think that's way too personal, and it defies my underlying position that you can't cabin someone. I hope that when people look at my work, I think this is demonstrated because I'm not filibusterable, is that, in fact, I take positions like Nick takes with respect to Missouri versus Holland, and no one ever won a political office by holding a sign Missouri versus Holland. Okay, there's a difference. Because you're open-minded. Well, yes, but, and that's why I don't, I think that there should be a difference between strong political labels and looking at the scholarship. And if there has been, I, I suspect you're right. This happened to feminists, too. The only reason I was on the Wisconsin faculty, Vicki Schultz, who's at, at Yale and I, the only reason we're on the faculty at Wisconsin is because a Republican voted for us. Why? Feminists were anti-liberal. So I get it, and I get the rage, and I get hating being put in a box. But by saying there are only three professors of some persuasion, then I'm in some other box, right? Or I'm, you know. So I really want to urge you that not to go too far as to burn your allies. I mean, there are plenty of moderates whose scholarship defies the conventional liberal conservative split. In fact, I think. I mean, this is why I have no friends, obviously, Jim, um, because, you know, I'm not a textualist and I'm not a purposivist, okay? So I reject the terms of the debate. So my libertarian students love me in statutory interpretation. Um, but, you know, that I refuse to want to do the kind of thing you're talking about, which is to label faculties one way or another. And the other thing about Georgetown is I wasn't there when Nick was hired. I just joined the faculty, you know, I'm not here to defend it in, in those terms, but I am worried about those terms precisely because I think it would be harder to get the members of the Harvard faculty or the Yale faculty to take my initial premise, which is that law and politics are different because everybody in the academy has taken that, has had that position since Max Radin in the 1930s and the realists. And that is a problem. That's a real problem if you want to attack it. Could I just have 30 seconds on uh, SSRN uh, downloads? Um, SSRN downloads are terrific. They are the million model working. I mean, that is the ideas are out there in the marketplace of ideas. Uh, if there are more downloads of scholarship by uh, conservatives and libertarians than by uh, liberals, that's terrific. That may be the marketplace of ideas uh, operating just the way it ought to. But I would say I think any faculty that said we're going to do faculty hiring by doing SSRN uh, counts would be surrendering its fiduciary responsibility to make quality judgments about what scholarship that merits appointment and what's not. Yes. Just to uh, push back a little bit on what Professor Nurse said and the, the point that you've been making again and again on politics and law are separate, certainly I agree with that in, in, entirely. Uh, but with respect to certain legal topics, I think that it is just true that political views can make a difference into how one sees the issue. So for example, if you're teaching 14th Amendment law to your students and you're covering uh, the, the cases that were just argued, the same-sex marriage cases, and the question is, is there a rational basis for the traditional definition of marriage? Now, I would hope that people could acknowledge that there are reasonable disagreements on that issue. But the fact is that in our Harvard faculty and in a lot of faculties, the traditional marriage view is just viewed as flat out unreasonable. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that there are not a lot of people on those faculties who hold the traditional marriage view as a political matter and who've had the chance to, to discuss it with their fellow faculty members and show them that there are reasonable arguments on this. So I think it's a little too simplistic to, to just say law and politics are separate, which I agree with, and therefore pol the political and ideological diversity of the faculty is irrelevant. Well, let's try and see if we can get to where, uh, um, and this is a deep jurisprudential discussion, as I know all the panelists know about the realists and 
the response to them, many of them who were at Harvard, and this happened in the 30s. This is a long running argument. Um, I think there is an area we can agree, Joel, about the difference between law and politics. Um, I will say that what happens when you teach constitutional law, and this is because of a transformation that I've written about in the 20th century about what constitutional law is about. It has become, in people's eyes, about politics, and the Supreme Court has helped it become that. Um, it's not, this is why I often, you know, I teach constitutional history, I teach about the separation of powers, I won't teach classes where the students are just spouting what I think is politics. Why? I'm there to teach you how to argue the case. If you don't know the other side, and you don't know the other side better than they do, you lose. When I argued for the government, and I won almost all but one of my cases, which Harry Edwards made me lose twice, I did that because I knew what the other side was going to say. So look, there are, Charles Freed said about the, Randy's argument, oh, it was baloney, right? Charles Freed is an eminent former solicitor general, et cetera. A lot of people, when he first made the argument, a lot of people, when they look at my argument against, they say, originally, oh, that's no, you know, they, they're just, they're not thinking about it hard, or Missouri versus Holland. I mean, that's what a great scholar does. Now, of course, they're going to throw up their hands. Now, I would hope that people at Harvard were teaching the possibility of a rational basis. Why? You can't, I mean, I go up to the Supreme Court and advise on statutory cases, I'm always telling the people what they have to argue against. So I would hope in teaching constitutional law, they would actually give you the opposite side of the argument. Now I agree that for purposes of students, we should have a diverse student body and have students feel comfortable raising these issues. When it's at the cusp of politics, it's always hard for the students to raise the issues. And I understand that because of the dynamics and the hierarchy. But I would hope that you would see both, both sides of the issue, and I think it's sad if you don't. I would, um, next question, but I would point out that Charles Freed still says the Supreme Court's position on that case is baloney. And he just recently said that the President Obama's position on not defending the Defense of Marriage Act is baloney too. So he's got it, he's got it covered, yes sir. Um, I want to agree with Professor Morris's comments on the uh, impact of the lack of experience in government uh, as to law faculties and the huge presence of people with PhDs who've never practiced law, had a client, or worked in government. And I wondered if the other panelists, other than Professor Morris, might briefly comment on what they Yes, I, I, I do think that that is uh, a problem. Uh, I've, for every year for the past uh, 20 years, I have thought that the pendulum has swung so far in the direction of hiring uh, PhDs that I counsel students, uh, you don't need to worry about that. The pendulum has gone as far uh, as it can go. It's going to start swinging back, go into government, go into law practice for a few years, and you'll be in good stead. But no, it turns out that the pendulum is still going that way. <clears throat> Uh, just, just briefly, I, I agree that law professors should have substantial practice experience and should keep practicing. It can come in a wide variety of forms. It can be appellate writing. It can be litigation. Like when, when Victoria Norris asked question, does anyone here know what Rule 22 was? My reaction was, not that it was cloture, but that's the interpleader rule, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, I'd like to push um, Professor Paulson's argument for one point at least a little further, maybe push back against it as well. And that's, um, I see that intellectual diversity can be instrumental, but I see your point in that if you accept that the purpose of the study um, is the search for truth. But is it really intellectual diversity only a problem if liberalism, and I don't mean by that, you know, being on politically left of center nowadays, but the more general philosophical system that's liberal. It's only a problem because liberalism sort of rejects the idea that fundamental values or questions of good are knowable and intelligible. And therefore, diversity among um, viewpoints as to what those ends are is itself um, as deep value as a system like liberalism can tolerate. It's what? That <clears throat> because liberalism doesn't think that you can have one view of what, you know, the fundamental questions of life are, that it has to take diversity of those views regarding 
fundamental questions as itself a um, an important end. So that it's more than just instrumental value if liberalism is the background assumption behind both political liberals today and political conservatives today. And I think that's maybe why it has as much um, resonance and rhetorical force uh, as a as a critique of the the, the orthodoxy that exists now. I think that's an excellent point, is that, you know, it, it is you know, an article of liberal faith could be that there are no objective right answers, that every answer is as good as another, um, except the answer that there is some sort of objective lib uh, 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 truth proposition. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in part because that is the prevailing ideology. Um, that is, I think, why it is appropriate to appeal for greater intellectual diversity as a way of combating precisely this uh, orthodoxy. There's an internal contradiction built into that proposition, uh, but that's no reason not to exploit it in the service of, of getting what we think are, you know, what, what pe different people think are the right answers uh, into, the, into the play of debate. Professor Rosencrantz had a thought. Yeah, I just wanted uh, 30 seconds since I didn't get a rebuttal time and haven't gotten a question yet. I want to just want to make sure that my position was... I've got a uh, question for you, too. Excellent. My, um, I, I just wanted to respond to a couple of things that Dick said just because I didn't want my position to be um, misunderstood. Uh, f I, I absolutely was not setting forth an argument for some sort of affirmative action. So I, I think it's it sounded as though you thought maybe... Uh, I, I take your point that it is a zero-sum game, that we have to make trade-offs. I do think Harvard probably should be looking for the, you know, the best scholar, uh, and uh, I'm not, or at least not necessarily, endorsing any kind of affirmative action for uh, conservatives. You know, really what I think is um, uh, if faculties just would stop discriminating against them uh, or stop discriminating against them kind of uh, implicitly or even maybe accidentally or maybe subconsciously or however you want to define it, that's really all that I'm wanting to argue for so far, so far, I think. Um, and then uh, the second thing that I want to say both to Victoria and to Dick is, um, of course, I agree that Republican Democrat is not a perfect way to describe this. I'm not, at a, and I, I quite agree. It'd be unfortunate if we were all walking around with our lists, or if we all had to have our, um, you know, political uh, affiliation sort of publicized. Uh, but j just as you say, you know, I think these numbers are so stark and so extreme that we can get away with a not perfect proxy as to what it is we're describing. So. Uh, you know, whether you want to say conservatives or originalists or textualists or someone who might have given money to a Republican or someone who might vote for a Republican or someone who identifies as to the right of the American center, whatever, whatever you like, you're still at 116 to 3 at Georgetown. So uh, these numbers are so extreme, I think, that, you know, we, we can get into the weeds on the definitions, I think, when we get anywhere closer to, uh, you know, parity. I mean, I guess I'd say, you know, if we were in the 50s and we were talking about, well, you know, are you wanting for us to hire a, you know, a West African or a, like someone from the Caribbean or a South African? What exact category are you talking about? I mean, the answer would be any of them, any of them, anybody, it's fine. Uh, you know, I think these numbers are so stark that, you know, really we can have a very broad definition. We're almost out of time. Anyone else? I'll leave one question on the table for anyone who wants to take 30, 10 seconds to answer it. Uh, if there seems to be kind of a consensus we should not have affirmative action for law professors based on intellectual diversity, and I think there's a near consensus that you get more intellectual diversity from people of different political views than you do from people of different racial backgrounds, what's left of the argument from intellectual diversity in favor of racial preferences? I just would say I... Um Affirmative action is a very loaded word. I actually think that if we're talking about intellectual diversity, an unrepresented, underrepresented uh, point of view that students would benefit from hearing, uh, then I had meant to leave open the possibility that I was in favor of that rather than announcing myself part of a consensus that we didn't I'm want. sorry, I, I misread you, so thank you for clarifying that. Any, anyone else on that, or should I adhere to the, ten, to the limitation to go 10 minutes over and not a minute more? I think I should. 
I think I should. I think I thank you all. And thank you all. Thanks to the audience for your patience.